Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Texas A&M School of Law's webinar, Training Social Justice Lawyers Today. This is the fifth installment of our spring 2021 TAMU Law Answers conversation, Conversations in Law and Social Justice webinar series. Um, our final webinar in the series is on April 22nd, and that will be on farm worker employment justice. Our webinars are every other Thursday at noon central time, and you can register for the upcoming webinar at tamulawanswers.info. Today's webinar is co-sponsored by the Texas A&M School of Law, the Network for Justice, which is part of the American Bar Foundation's project, The Future of Latinos in the United States, and the American Bar Association's Commission on Hispanic Legal Rights and Responsibilities. Uh, today, we have the privilege of, of having uh, a number of, of uh, professors, law professors, clinical professors that are here today to talk with us um, about social justice and teaching it in our clinics in particular. And um, I don't go through all of the bios because all of our speakers have such great uh, accomplishments. You can find more information about them on the website. Uh, but we have Carrie Bedinger Lopez who's at the University of Miami School of Law. She teaches in the Human Rights Clinic. Denise uh, Cordova Montes, who's at the University of Miami as well, and also teaches in the Human Rights Clinic. And then we have Professor Deborah Archer from the NYU School of Law, who also teaches uh, in a clinic. And we have the privilege of having this uh, conversation moderated by Professor Louise Trebek, who uh, was formerly a clinician at the University of Wisconsin Law School. So again, you can see their full bios on tamulawanswers.info. And I will say that while some of our panelists are attorneys, uh, they will be discussing the law generally and nothing in the webinar should be considered uh, to be providing legal advice. Attendees who have a question should consult their own legal advisor to address their own circumstances. Today's conversation won't really focus on legal advice, but uh, more teaching ideas. Um, after the initial presentation, we will have a question and answer session. So you can feel free to type in your questions, any questions that you have into the Zoom question and answer feature at any time. And the panelists will do, our, will do their best to address and submit any questions as time allows. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my colleague and, and friend, uh, Professor Louise Trebek, who I recently had the pleasure of working with and producing an article that touches about touches upon uh, how we think about social justice lawyers and lawyering today. So Professor Trebek, if you want to take the lead in the conversation. Thank you, Louise. I'm so happy to be here and see such a good audience out there of participants. We're very excited about today's program. So we're talking about training social justice lawyers. So recent developments have made the uh, necess necessary to have some innovation in the way we train our students and the way social justice lawyering is conducted. We have uh, social and economic inequality has been displayed before us and uh, sexism and racism continues unabated. In addition, we have some people who are seeking to undermine the rule of law and other communities that are now very skeptical about the ability of law to uh, prohibit and uh, cut back on discrimination and inequality. So into this new world, we have uh, law teachers who are attempting to explore new ways of teaching about social justice lawyering in ways that will uh, reflect the new world in which we're in. So we have three uh, esteemed scholars who are working in this field of innovation in our teaching and also in our understanding of what makes uh, effective social justice practice so that we can uh, train our students in understanding their roles in their careers in that field. So we're going to have Deborah Archer first, followed by Carrie and then Denise. So Deborah, you're on. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, discussion. Looking forward to learning from my co-panelists and uh, from those who are uh, listening in. I think as the world is changing, I'm constantly thinking about how I engage in social justice advocacy 
um, as as an advocate myself, and then also constantly thinking about how I can better engage my students to, to do the work. And today I want to focus on one piece that I've been thinking about a lot lately, and that is um, trying to uh, get our students and teach our students to break out of the silos that we're often in. I think that we as advocates and teachers often think in silos um, and work in silos and in turn model that siloing for our students. It is a broader problem with legal education that of course has been replicated in our clinical programs and in clinical pedagogy. I think it often starts in college. Many students get to college and are either um, interested in absolutely everything um, or not interested in anything at all, which is the experience I'm having with my son who's a senior in high school. And so college often do as much as they can to progressively narrow a student's academic focus. And law sco schools too often pick up on that. And law students are often learning in silos. They have like a laser-like focus on immigration or on education or on housing, or they consider themselves to just be policy advocates or strategic litigators um, or movement lawyers, or they're focused on federal advocacy or local advocacy. And we often put ourselves in teaching silos along those same dimensions um, in our clinics. Um, I, I do agree that specialization has many benefits and I'm really not arguing against specialization. Um, and I also think it's very important for everyone to have and understand their own theory of change. But I do believe that our students should understand the need to be willing and able to step outside of those silos when it's necessary for advancing justice. The issues um, our clients and their clients bring to us are far more than the specific legal issues they initially present. But as students and professors, we don't often step out of our many silos to engage with a broader context or to think in terms of powers and systems that uh, came together to lead to the, that specific problem. And this approach may bring some resolution to the client's immediate situation, but it doesn't often lead to the deep long-term um, power shifting that we need, and it doesn't often lead to community equity and justice. Um, I think even more so over the past year, we recognize that the world is coming, becoming more interdisciplinary and interconnected. And the problems that we see um, in terms of racial justice and other types of um, injustice are entrenched and they're complex and they're systemic. Inequality is really embedded into our structures and systems, our policies, um, practices, um, and our norms. And to drive deep change, we have to try to impact those systems and policies and practices and norms. And no system works in isolation. Uh, in order to address these uh, types of challenges, instead of focusing on one system, I believe that we have to make sure that our students um, are able to think about how to impact multiple systems at one time or how to use tools from one system to impact another system. Uh, too often, the lawyer that thinks that, they, I, I think lawyers think that um, there's a single switch that they can flip to solve um, a problem and they get very focused on finding and identifying that a uh, single flip. I, uh, I found that with my students when we talk about policing and the problem of racialized um, police violence against communities of color. My students think that there is one switch that, they, that we all can flip. And if we flip that switch, we're gonna be able to solve all the problems in policing. When in fact, um, the problem that has led to that, one, that incident of racialized police violence that we witness um, comes from many sources. It comes from uh, racial segregation. It's an employment um, issue. It is a, a substance abuse um, disorder issue. It is a homelessness problem. It is um, a problem of over-policing in communities. Uh, it's it's so many things, um, and if students believe that there's only there's one single way to solve that problem, we're never actually going to solve that problem. Uh, in addition, the I, I think the silos within which we operate don't always serve our clients and communities well. 
And it sometimes leads us to use tools that are too small or too narrow for the problems we face. Some of the most powerful and innovative solutions to injustice, to marginalization, to disadvantage are distributed throughout our legal, social, and political systems. And in the end, if we continue to engage um, within the silos and the layers of silos, we're not exposing our students to all of those tools and ways of thinking they need as advocates to address the complex and systemic nature of um, today's social justice challenges. I've also found that many of my students don't have an accurate understanding of how systems, uh, local, national, international, political, economic, and social, physical, and cultural all come together to shape inequality. And without this understanding, the legal and non-legal tactics that could be used to dismantle the underlying systems are, are often overlooked. Um, I, I think it's important for students and advocates to consider the roles these larger structures play in creating and maintaining subordination of a community, uh, in addition to thinking about um, the impact on our individual clients. Uh, I think students would benefit from seeing the, 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 the under, uh, seeing and understanding the systemic oppression underlying um, the impact on the community often focus on the law, uh, but ignore the ways in which systemic oppression encompass oppressive structures at the interpersonal and institutional level. It's embedded in our value systems and in, in that way impacts more than the individual client. Or they don't focus on the way that multiple institutions and sets of norms are often at play in causing or maintaining an injustice. And so uh, that's something that motivates me in how I think about how I engage with my students. It motivates me in the types of cases uh, we take and therefore I have to prepare my students to uh, engage in those types of cases. So some of the approaches that I use in my teaching to help affect um, this shift that I'm trying to to, to embody as a, as a teacher, as an advocate and get my students to embody. Um, first is mindset. I think it starts with a shift in mindset and expanding the way we ask our students to think about and engage with the problems presented by our clients and our community partners. So I ask my students to think about, to be, I'm explicit um, in asking them to think about how they can work with marginalized communities to advocate for systemic change and to build power. I want them to see and respect the specific legal issues presented in their cases, um, but also the larger societal context in which this issue is situated and figure out how to position their work to challenge both, uh, to explore the broader intertwined legal and social is issues that are connected and woven through and into the legal questions that their clients bring. Um, and I ask them explicitly to focus on systems and power and a deeper understanding of the complexity of the problems faced by uh, entire impacted communities and to help envision an altered and more just um, future. Uh, second, I would say I try to um, get my students to embrace the transformational potential of integrated advocacy uh, to help them break out of their silos and to be more effective in the fight for social change. And so integrated advocacy, I consider to be strategic litigation, community organizing, interdisciplinary collaboration, legislative uh, advocacy, policy reform, uh, public ac uh, education or direct action and any other form of advocacy all working together to achieve social change. So in my clinic, we don't limit ourselves to just one or even two tools in the lawyer's toolkit. We approach every problem presented without limiting our consideration of the best way to tackle that problem. And after parsing the underlying issues, we identify what we can and should do on behalf of and in partnership with impacted communities and individuals. And this includes determining the most effective um, advocacy approach given who we are um, and where we are in this situation. And sometimes it means that we have to engage with partners and that teaches them an additional skill of collaboration and, and partnership. Um, 
I, I, again, I think in order to affect the kind of systemic change that we should be focused on, law students have to learn what levers, all the levers that are available to achieve that change, and then learn when, where, and how to pull each lever. A lawyer has many tools in um, our toolbox, and we need to know how to use um, all of them. I mentioned that I, I asked them to take a systemic uh, focus view of the problem. Um, I'm explicit about that as well. I talk to them about engaging in cross-disciplinary advocacy. We do that a lot within, um, the, within NYU, working with um, other schools outside of the law school uh, to explore and engage on uh, some of the problems facing our clients. Um, I also focus on helping them to think about how to integrate both positive and negative conceptions of equality into their advocacy. And so, of course, while utilizing courts to prohibit or limit actions that infringe on individual rights is an important skill, the work we do in the clinic also helps them understand that advocates should be able to articulate a positive vision of what stakeholders can or should do uh, to better promote, protect, and respect those those rights. And then finally, I engage my students at the beginning of um, every representation in a power mapping exercise. Um, and I think it's another way of helping students break down the problem, but also try to identify advocacy alternatives. So I asked them to um, discuss and find out who has power in this situation, the relative levels of power, who has incentives to use that power to help our cause, or to use that power um, against us in our cause, and then figuring out ways to shift power or for individuals or groups to leverage power. Um, and so I, I think that, that all of these things coming together really do help my students not only uh, change the way that they think about the work that they should be doing and can be doing uh, to push us closer to social justice and to um, battle with the kind of uh, challenges and inequality we're facing, but then also to start them along the process of developing those, those tools. So I, I was told we had 10 minutes. If I have time later, I'd love to talk about scholarships. I know a lot of clinicians are um, engaged in scholarship and how we can use our scholarship uh, differently as well. But I'll, I'll end there and look forward to questions. Carrie, you're on now. Wonderful, thank you, Deborah. That was great. Um, and. Uh, very inspiring and and uh, I think all of our presentations have a nice segue to one another. So I am going to share my screen. Um, and uh, before I do that, I, I also want to thank the organizers of this uh, presentation, this webinar and look forward to the Q and A. Um, I am, as uh, Louise mentioned and Luz mentioned, a human rights clinician. And um, I like to see my, my work uh, kind of in human rights grounded of course, in social justice lawyering um, with a strong focus on human rights in the US and its connection to human rights uh, globally. So you'll see that reflected in this presentation, which I will share now. Okay, um, so this presentation kind of uh, captures uh, my own and my colleague, uh, Denise Cordova Montes's uh, presentation. She will um, share her screen separately afterwards, but. Hopefully you'll see some connections between the two. Okay, so as we think uh, about current challenges in human rights lawyering, I want to kind of, I wanna uh, preface this by saying um, that I think my comments and a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of the pieces here, though they may be framed in terms of kind of the words human rights, they are much more broadly applicable to uh, thinking about social justice lawyering, um, and in particular, thinking about some of the connection between cause-based and client-based lawyering, um, some of the pieces that Deborah just mentioned. So um, some of the ideas that I'm going to present, I derived from an article that I co-authored with some brilliant uh, clinicians who focus in different areas, both poverty law and uh, international human rights, um, as well as community lawyering. And um, we took on this question uh, that was based on a panel that we put together at a AALS clinical conference uh, about a decade ago, taking on uh, the question about um, different narratives in uh, human rights lawyering and uh, as well as poverty law practice. 
and where we could use critical legal theory to uh, push ourselves as teachers and practitioners um, to take more critical lens to our lawyering and advocacy um, and, um, and push ourselves kind of beyond the bounds, uh, as Deborah was saying, of, of the silos that um, have traditionally been created for us in our fields um, and, uh, and beyond. So we took on looking at uh, imperialist narratives um, uh, where, and Macau Matua um, in, a, in a very classic article that I will show you in a, in a few slides, um, takes this on kind of um, uh, 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 impugning the human rights movement of uh, creating kind of a, a tripartite uh, uh, approach of there's savages and victims and saviors, right? And, um, and kind of the, uh, whether it's law clinics or human rights lawyers kind of swooping in to save the day as the saviors, uh, recreating many of the imperialist narratives that um, we, uh, are, we think we are trying to deconstruct. And so um, kind of taking, that, taking on that critique, thinking about the ways in which um, we, we can so often es uh, essentialize and disempower uh, victims or survivors of human rights violations and kind of um, uh, position them as, as kind of helpless victims um, and, uh, and ways in which we other, uh, whether it's within our, the bounds of our own country or um, out there somewhere else in the world, right? The idea um, that either human rights violations are not happening in the United States or um, that, uh, that many people who are engaged in the practice of human rights and social justice lawyering you know, as Deborah was really underscoring, um, do not see uh, the, the connections um, in their own communities and to their own lives and to their own presence. Uh, so, um, so the Bringing Human Rights Home Network, which some folks on this, uh, on this uh, webinar may be a part of, is run out of Columbia Law School. It's a network of about 800 lawyers across the country who are interested in thinking about international human rights strategies to overlay onto domestic social justice and civil rights lawyering. And I commend it to anybody who's interested in kind of thinking about the interconnections there. Okay, so um, just to, to mention, we were inspired uh, by the article that Louise and Luz uh, wrote, The Emerging Legal Architecture for Social Justice, where they took on um, uh, kind of a, a modern day view on, uh, on looking at critical legal theory. It's a fresh, great fresh article. Uh, they talk about how critical legal theory exposes neutral law as a myth. Um, tra challenges traditional legal pedagogy that focuses on doctrine um, and that does not expose uh, racist, sexist, and classist tropes and legal precedent, um, dismantling this lawyer as hero paradigm and um, aiming to transform legal practices to better serve the values of equality and social solidarity. And we see this, of course, manifested in many of the critical legal theory movements um, that I list here. So, um, in our clinic, and I'm going to give a few concrete examples of this, um, we really challenge students to think about what community lawyering means and to overlay that into the human rights context to really take on um, the history of the human rights enterprise and, and make sure we are grounding our work in a collaborative lawyering approach, thinking about kind of the networks we're building in our own communities and beyond, um, what participant control means, uh, and and kind of creating um, vibrant partnerships with both non-lawyer and local actors. Um, of course, taking on kind of an intersectional view of uh, race, gender, ability, and class oppression and um, underscoring for students, and this is very important, uh, the complex coalitions uh, that, um, that make up communities, right? Many students kind of may come to our clinic thinking that um, one group or one um, sector represents uh, a particular community that, uh, that, that is our partner. And um, breaking that down oftentimes with our community partners is very eye-opening for our students and for ourselves. Um, and, and kind of prompting ourselves to be adaptive. Um, those are all kind of skills that we're very intentional about. Um, because of time, I'm just gonna highlight a few of these, but these are some ethics principles that, um, that we have uh, developed in coordination with our students over the years. Um, again, thinking about kind of broader coalitions and movements, combining litigation and non-litigation strategies. And even as Deborah was saying, as we do that, not thinking about a one size fits all solution and, and pushing our students to kind of think big um, at the outset and then think strategically and tactically as we hone um, potential 
solutions that our clinic will undertake, building alliances, transnational as well as local, um, and, uh, and teaching self-reflective lawyering and uh, underscoring the importance of intentionality and anticipation of un unintended consequences. Um, so I just wanna talk about a, a kind of framework that we teach about this. Um, we teach, we, we call it the client to cause continuum, the idea of, of kind of placing before students, how does cause litigation or a rights campaign, how does that compare to the traditional lawyer client model that they are taught in the first year of law school and beyond? Um, and we map out kind of three different categories of stakeholders in human rights advocacy. Um, we think about advocacy partners, the consti our constituents and the beneficiaries. And we think about where, um, where a traditional lawyer client model uh, maps onto that. We think about whether legal ethics as it's presented in law school on the MPRE, um, does that provide a sufficient lens for examining the, these complex ethical issues in human rights practice and these complex sets of stakeholders that Denise will be uh, really underscoring in her own presentation in a few minutes. Um, and we look at the ethical codes of other professions, medical, academic, journalist, and humanitarian, and we ask whether those ethical codes um, can help us uh, to understand our role as cause lawyers and, um, and human rights lawyers. Um, these are a couple of snapshots of uh, our syllabus where we offer uh, readings and kind of a preview for students. Um, here's the Macau Matua article that I mentioned. We offer some recent cr critiques from feminists from the global south of, um, of human rights advocates and women's rights advocates in the global north, kind of offering to help and offering their critique and uh, of, of how things are so wrong in another part of the world. And we take, take that on um, in our classroom. Um, and then we have a simulation that we provide to students uh, that they are able to kind of take, take these questions on in a three-part simulation. As you see here, we also offer uh, several ethical codes for them to look at, um, to prompt them to kind of think about whether and how the, um, these ethical codes map onto uh, the human rights practice that we are engaged in in our clinic. Um, and finally, I just want to kind of offer um, five factors that uh, that I think kind of guide us in our own development of our docket and um, in, in the way we kind of teach our students about uh, the utility of, uh, of the work that they are doing. Um, so uh, first being survivor dignity, uh, and I'm happy to talk about these in more detail, uh, but survivor dignity, um, the coalition and movement building that human rights uh, and other cause-based advocacy movements and campaigns uh, offer. Um, the normative developments uh, and accountability mechanisms that may arise from a particular campaign, uh, the political pressure that can be derived from a rights-based campaign, and finally changing hearts and minds through public opinion. Uh, and so these are kind of some of the guideposts as well as the guardrails that we use in judging kind of whether a project is um, going to uh, advance the goals of of human rights, as well as the pedagogical goals that we set out for ourselves um, as teachers in our human rights clinic. Uh, so now I will turn it over to Denise um, to give you a snapshot of how some of these factors and considerations come into, uh, into, the, in, into our own decision-making. I'll stop my share. Thank you. Um... Carrie, and thank you to the organizers um, for inviting us. Um, so here I will be sharing my um, presentation. Can you all see it? Yes, I hope so. Okay, great. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I will be spending the next um, 10 minutes talking about um, sort of a very concrete example that applies the, the framework that Carrie just described which revolves around um, sustained and long-term support to particular groups on the basis of longstanding relationships that I, that I brought with me from my time as a human rights lawyer prior to joining the clinic. Um, my name is Denise Cordova Montes, and as Carrie mentioned, I co-teach um, in the human rights clinic together with, with Carrie. Um, I'm a, I'm a newish clinician and that I joined the human rights clinic in, in 2019. And, and I came to this topic of employing um, a critical 
theory lens in, in my work as a human rights lawyer on, on sort of the basis of my own personal experience as someone who um, grew up in the U.S. as an undocumented immigrant and often had to, to witness this empowering narratives being constructed about me and my community by people sort of external to my experience. And this led me to, to really try to embrace um, a critical theory um, lens when it comes to, to my work and, and also now my project selections as a, as a clinician. Um, and in the in the projects um, I supervise, I've I've sought to really engage in this intentionally collaborative process that that Carrie has described, um, where human rights law and lawyers are seen as just one more tool, and and social movement led advocacy, and and um, I I uh, seek to have these these projects really focus on building power, shifting power in communities, so that uh, they shape their own narratives. And so today I will um, use one, um, I will talk about one specific example from my work um, and which um, the clinic was, was involved in uh, over the last couple of years, which focused on the creation and implementation of a practical guide on how to build um, a human right to food agenda based on recently adopted international human rights law standards. And um, my clinic students were involved in every aspect of the work and I will um, I will describe how they were uh, involved later on in the presentation, but first I want to talk about sort of the, the, the work uh, in the project itself. And um, the methodology for the practical guide um, really just sought to build momentum around both like experience sharing and political organizing to bring people, women in particular, um, together to share their experiences with, with food insecurity and hunger, sort of break the silence and isolation around these issues while also taking steps to sort of advance the political organizing at the community level around sort of the right to food and, and to grow the movement. Um, and, and so the idea for developing this methodology originated during a meeting in, um, in Mexico City in 2019. Here we have, um, it was a, a, it included several women who had been involved in different ways in international standard setting processes around the right to food of rural indigenous and small scale food producing women. Um, and it um, included women from various continents um, and some were lawyers, some were academics, but most were leaders of social movements. And most of us had worked together uh, for years uh, prior to, to coming together at this meeting. And so this was pre-COVID, obviously we met over a period of three days and uh, the purpose was to identify how to, how to foster the implementation of these like recently um, adopted international human rights instruments that we saw as is quite powerful, and um, and we saw the potential in these tools and these instruments uh, for advancing sort of the rights of rural women at the local level. Um, and so, throughout the course of these um, three days, um, and but also in the months that followed, we jointly developed a methodology that attempted to create a more like forward-looking, participatory, non-hierarchical tool that we called this "cooking up political agendas." And um, we attempted to use terms that would resonate with groups of, of rural and indigenous women and reclaim sort of the concept of the common cooking pot, which we used as a metaphor throughout the guide, uh, which has historical and political significance, particularly for Latin American women, um, where um, which the vast majority of the women who are involved in this, in this uh, work were Latin American. And um, so in Latin America, women were living under authoritarian regimes and would often come together while cooking around the community pot and discuss politics and actions of resistance and, and ways to respond to economic and food crisis. And we use this metaphor throughout the guide. Um, the process itself was very collaborative um, and, and also we intended for the guide to be used collectively as well. Um, the guide um, was uh, meant to be a tool for communities to sort of diagnose and analyze and come up with their own action plan on how to best use or not use the recently adopted human rights instruments. Um, and so we had a number of group exercises in the guide, um, like this one here, you can sort of see it, um, that uh, were meant to be easily applied uh, by a wide variety of rural women around the world. We'll also, uh, we try to design them in a way that they could be adapted to the different realities of the women who would end up using them. Um, and while we presented the recently adopted international human rights frameworks in the guide, we also, um, as I mentioned before, we designed the exercises so that the women, we would be encouraging sort of the women who, who would come together um, to, to discuss these instruments in a critical way and ask them to reflect how, uh, about how the instruments were not useful, to question sort of the implicit framing behind some of what was in the instruments, to reflect on what was missing and how um, human rights protections could be expanded. 
Um, and throughout the process of crafting the guide, we worked also closely with a designer who had specific experience working with social movements. And uh, this designer would attend all of our virtual meetings and, and change sort of the drawings in real time as we were speaking so that the tools that were ultimately um, created really followed the essence of our discussions in a format that was meant to be accessible uh, for a wide audience. We used mind maps in addition to, to the written word to express ideas. Um, we also um, devoted significant space to, um, to experience sharing in the guide. We had sort of the voice and personal stories of rural and indigenous women who were co-authors sort of interspersed throughout um, the guide. And, um, and we also uh, shared sort of social movement led alternative frameworks um, in, in the guide. And um, since launching the guide, we've started implementing the guide with various communities of women around the world um, and in the US as well and um, have invited sort of anyone who is using the guide to share the process through social media to foster sort of this transnational exchange of ideas and experiences. Um, and last semester, uh, my clinic students and I were involved in the implementation of this guide with women in Ecuador virtually. This semester we're doing, uh, we're implementing the guide um, with women in Guatemala, again, virtually. And we have recently also been invited to have um, uh, to use this guide uh, in, in a discussion with women in West Virginia, for example, here, who um, as part of efforts that are taking place in West Virginia to organize women around a state constitutional amendment on the right to food. Um, so my clinic students have really, as I mentioned earlier, been involved in every um, aspect, ooh, okay, in every aspect of, of the work. Um, and we are lucky in that we have a full year clinic. And so students are able to really immerse themselves in this in their work. Um, we, in addition, have a few select students who stay on for an additional year as fellows. And so um, some students are involved in their project work for a full two years. Um, and so I've really had students who have been able to involve in every, in the whole process. Um, and, um, you know, while students at the beginning were primarily responsible for sort of writing the sections in the guide that revolved around sort of digesting and summarizing these international instruments, um, uh, they were also attending every single meeting that the group was having as we were developing the guide. Um, and so this really just enabled them to, to gain sort of a deep understanding of the audience too that they were writing for and also have, have ownership over, over what was being produced. Um, and Many of these um, students that I'm working with uh, as part of this work are, are Latinx students. Um, and so indeed they're also sort of reconnecting with their own histories, the, you know, with the, the histories of their parents, the countries of their parents, their grandparents. And so it's been a really, um, I think, enriching experience for some of these students. Um, they've um, helped lead consultations with women in Ecuador and Guatemala using the guide um, and have also supported drafting reports to the UN regional human rights bodies on the basis of, of these consultations. And pre-COVID as well, they were able to actually attend some of the, of the sort of strategic gatherings with the social movement leaders that were taking place. Um, and students who were involved in the process have also been invited by these social movement leaders themselves to, to moderate and present in online webinars that they're having on, on um, relevant topics or to talk about their own involvement in the development of the guide because um, students were seen sort of as allies to the movement. And, um, and so this has also been um, a really just, uh, again, fulfilling experience. I think there were students who at times would, would mess up as they were presenting, for example, because they were nervous. Uh, this was the first time that they were presenting to a, to a wide audience. And um, the, the social movement leaders would come to their defense because they knew them. They, they had seen sort of the sustained support that these students had provided. Um, they, they saw students as part of their ecosystem um, and sort of understood the value of training future generations of social movement lawyers um, that support their cause. Um, so I know that we only have 10 minutes, so I'm out of time. I'd be happy to discuss um, more during the Q&A session. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay, well, um, uh, what I think I'm going to do, since there's so much connection between these uh, presenters, is to have, uh, have two topics that I'd like us to all discuss together. Uh, the first is um, your innovative clinics can be seen as underpay, underplaying the importance of legal expertise. And this can be a barrier uh, within your institutions, uh, and it can be a barrier for students enrolling or some students who 
give pushback about this is not what I went to law school for. So how do you describe to your students and to your institution the usefulness of legal expertise for the social justice practice that you are engaging in? So this is to all, to three of you, as well as Luz. So who would like to start? Unmute yourself. <laughs> I'm happy to start. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I would say two things. Um, I also teach a first year elective, a second semester elective of international human rights law. And even though that's not the clinic, I bring a lot of these themes. I try to bring a critical lens to a lot of the themes that I'm teaching the one else. And so first of all, they're you know, they're, they're getting the critical themes and the critical lens that they're not getting through the 1L class and they're getting international human rights, which they're not getting through their 1L, other 1L classes. And, and, and then kind of in the human rights clinic space with the upper level students, um, uh, you know, they are, um, they are also kind of saying, wait, what? You want me to engage with documentary filmmakers? You want me to um, support, uh, you know, a street protest? You want me to just listen to what the community-based organization is, you know, is kind of ticking through in terms of its own agenda. And, and I don't see where I, I play in. So I guess my first point is like, whether you're teaching kind of quote unquote doctrine in a, in a more traditional class or whether you're teaching a, a clinic, um, uh, if you're incorporating a lot of the themes that we're talking about in this webinar, you're going to get that pushback. Um, and uh, and so I found that to be kind of interesting um, in my own teaching. I would say something very, there's a lot of different ways I deal with this, but um, one, uh, one way that I find is to try to make connections at the outset. Um, I can now anticipate when my students are gonna get that deer in headlights uh, look and um, say, oh my God, how is this connected? Why, I, I, this is not law school material. And so I try to immediately draw connections to them to, um, to wells or, or a post in the ground that they can locate um, as, as kind of law, right? And so whether it's um, a relation back to another core class like Civ Pro um, or, or, or torts, right? And kind of to, to themes that are drawn from those. And then the limitations oftentimes of those, um, of those legal uh, uh, arenas. Um, to kind of prompt them to say, okay, because there are such limitations in the law in those places that you have studied in your other classes, how can you use kind of this moment in time to rethink what justice means and, um, and to look to our partners um, who, uh, and, and community members and affected individuals who um, are on the ground level who have experienced the injustice like asking them, starting with them, asking what, what would they want to do to repair the harm? And then you kind of work up from there. Um, so, so yeah, those are the two, those are two things that I do kind of anytime I can kind of reference other places in their law school experience that they, they might see as kind of true law, but then unpack it for them about the deficiencies, uh, the justice deficiencies in those kind of legal arenas as they apply to the situation at hand. And then secondly, kind of really asking them to just start from, start from scratch uh, from, from their own preconceived notions of what the injustice meant and ask, like derive, derive that definition from our partners who we have the luxury of being willing to engage with us to define it in their own terms um, and define justice and, and remedies in their own terms. Okay, Did Deborah want to say something to add yeah, to that? Yeah, I would just add, um, add uh, very quickly that I start just very fundamentally pushing back against um, the idea that any of this is not uh, what, what lawyers do. And um, right, that's part of the reimagining and re-envisioning our role in fighting for social justice, that this is what lawyers, um, what lawyers do. Um, and particularly given the role that law has played in creating um, and perpetuating all of the injustices and inequality that they're fighting, the law has to play a role um, in helping to tear that down. And that's what, what, what we are supposed to be training them to do. So I um, ask my students when we're looking at these challenges um, to think about identifying kind of the source and structure um, of the inequality. Like what is the framework that is creating this inequality? 
often that involves the um, a, a legal aspect of the, and the law. Then second, they have to figure out how to tear that down. And often the law is a part of that strategy in tearing down um, the structure of inequality. And then their work is, involves rebuilding a structure that leads us to more equity and the law is integrated in that as well. So I think what we're doing is uh, telling them that legal expertise shouldn't be the center of, of a strategy. It is not um, the, the, you know, the crown jewel in an advocacy strategy, but it is, um, I think, almost always an important part um, of that and their skills that our students bring to the table that um, the other folks who are they're working with won't bring to the table. An example is um, my students went on um, um, legislator visits uh, when we were working with a group of uh, youth led organizers from an organization called Teens Take Charge. Um, and for every um, legislative visit, there was a law student and there was a student from Teens Take Charge. And the law students took the lead on answering questions about the law and the, how the you know, changes to the law. And the students from Teens Take Charge took the lead on um, speaking about the facts and the impact that the law was having in, in their community and what they wanted to see happen. And so it's an example of a way that, we're, that the law, we recognize the importance of the law. We're working in partnership and collaboration um, with those who are directly um, impacted, but we're not elevating the law above um, other uh, factors and consideration. Okay, all right. So I, I have a second and follow-up question. Uh, and this is based on part on the questions that people that the uh, was submitted in the registration, which seems to me that was people are looking for, can law schools provide the, the space for these innovative clinics and encourage students to participate in these practices when they graduate? Uh, can, is the law school structure, uh, does it have to be changed? How could it be changed in order to be more supportive of these innovative uh, clinics? And uh, so um, I, I, here are uh, three examples um, that I can suggest. One is immersion clinics. It's interesting that, Car uh, that uh, Denise mentioned that. By that I mean, and uh, I've heard uh, Deborah talk about this, that clinics should be more credits and over a longer period of time. So you get what we call it was called immersion, that you have a, a, you're really part of a group and a structure that's working over a long period of time. So it isn't a chopped up experience. So that is one possibility for how law school could be restructured. Another one would be hybrid public private formats. In other words, linking 501c3 organizations directly with the clinics in some either a uh, semi-organized uh, way or through a sort of um, revised externship system where the, the uh, students are uh, quite heavily involved in the community organizations themselves. And uh, one of the reasons that people are interested in that has to do with funding, because in some cases it's easier to get funding for 501c3 organizations that are doing this kind of work and that the students can be supported that way. Um, and now you don't get involved with the bureaucracy of the university. So that's one of the second innovative ideas. And the third that I feel strongly about is that uh, students should join uh, particularly national, international organizations that uh, are interested in supporting um, social justice practice. That is, they should look for groups like uh, rebellious lawyering, uh, so, uh, other kinds of student groups, uh, uh, law and uh, the uh, political economy that have student groups that can provide support for them, not only in their law school, but broader. And also for clinicians and teachers who want to do this kind of work that they should encourage, be encouraged and could consider joining groups like CLIA uh, or SALT. So what other ideas do you all have for how the law school structures, if you feel the way law schools are structured now is a barrier or not, or a, a, a can be revised to encourage the sustainability of the kind of innovative practices and clinics and teaching you are engaged in. So let's start with Denise then. Sure. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that um, Carrie, myself, and also their, um, uh, another clinician that works with us in the Human Rights Clinic have been discussing is also, um, it's so difficult for 
um, students to get into the human rights field after graduation that we've also been sort of trying to, to find ways to, um, to raise funds to have like dedicated postgraduate um, fellowships uh, for human rights work, for example. So that's another way I think that we would, uh, because indeed like it's um, human rights um, NGOs and, and social movements are so, um, uh, they just don't have the ability to hire a brand new human rights um, law graduate to, to be supporting them and their cause. They, they will go for someone with the experience, but these, post, these dedicated postgraduate fellowships would indeed enable um, some of these students to continue doing the work to perhaps even partner up with, with a group that they've been working with uh, while they've been in the clinic um, and to really launch their career. So I think that's another way that law schools could do, could do more to support students entering um, into this field. Okay, so I just want to check with Luz. Luz is going to handle the question and answer from the participants. It's about time now. Do you think we should move into that? Do you have questions that you think we should move on to? We have a couple of questions. I think I'll, I'll add to uh, an answer to the question that you posed about what structures are in place or what might prohibit um, individuals from doing more of this work in law school. And I think it really depends on the law school because uh, depending on the law school, innovation is not always rewarded by the system of promotion and tenure. Um, and particularly how we look at scholarship and how we value service. And so I think that's uh, very structural. I think it's pervasive. Uh, it does vary according to institution. And I think for clinicians, we now have these other tracks of you know, clinical faculty that um, help alleviate some of the uh, more rigid structures that were traditionally in place. But I think there's still a ways to go in that. Um, obviously funding becomes an issue as well. Uh, and I think that was mentioned uh, already by a couple of the, the panelists, but there's definitely um, there's definitely a lot, we, a lot more we could do within law schools, and there, there, there are barriers. It's not always just the clinician or the professor uh, not feeling that they're rewarded, but it's also just kind of broader institutional support for the work. So, uh, but we do have a couple of questions. Um, I'll start with uh, the second one first, and then, because that's more specific, uh, really, how can private practice attorneys help support human rights attorneys in a meaningful way? So that's one question and I'll see who wants to take that one. Um, oh, I could just uh, briefly say that um, the Bringing Human Rights Home Lawyers Network that I mentioned before is a great way to get involved with uh, people who skate across private practice, NGOs, uh, law clinics and other areas um, in, in the United States and uh, that's a great network for you to just learn more about human rights advocacy that's going on in the United States and get connected uh, with others. And another idea might be to contact if, you, if there is a human rights clinic in your, you know, in your city or um, that you're familiar with, you know, put it out there that you might have some specific um, form of you know, legal expertise that could be helpful in a pro bono capacity. Um, there's probably lots of people who would be interested in taking you up on that. Before you move on to the next question, I just want to say we civil rights attorneys and civil rights clinics are also happy to get some private practice folks um, <laughs> engaged. And what I would say is, from my experience, um, the firms are um, happy to take on small, individual, uh, discrete cases, uh, the same kinds of cases that uh, many clinics take on. And I think that uh, I would hope that firms would be um, more open to engaging in uh, co um representation, co-counsel representation agreements with clinics to take on these larger systemic um, reform cases uh, that clinics are increasingly getting involved in. We have uh, two cases here where we are working with um, private firms as, as, as co-counsel um, and engaging with the students in a way that I think um, reflects and supports the goals of clinical education. So if you're gonna do that as a firm, also remember, um, you know, to elevate students and allow students to, to take the lead in these cases. Thank you, Deborah. We, we have another two questions, another one that came in, but one of them I think comes up pretty often. I've, I've heard this question a lot. It's basically, how do you, how do you, uh, you know, institute uh, lessons on racial justice when sometimes students of color say it makes them feel uncomfortable to bring it up? 
And so the question is, do you have any recommendations uh, or tools on how to best teach racial justice to large classes of clinical students who might come from different backgrounds? Who wants to, who wants to get us started on that one? <laughs> Luz, maybe you're gonna to have to answer that one. Oh gosh, okay. Well, I'm one. happy to answer. I just talked, I tend to talk too much. So I'm trying to yeah, go ahead. defer to my other, uh, to other folks as, as well. But Luz, why don't you start? Sure. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's really kind of acknowledging that everybody has a different experience and that everybody's experience counts. And that the lessons that we have to learn apply to all of us, but we're going to look at kind of current, current, you know, uh, current happenings. For me, that's the way that I approached it. Uh, that's, I mean, I just had a class on this like last week, right? Uh, where we acknowledge kind of where people are coming from these different viewpoints and what structurally is under, underpinning this, right? And so, so I, I don't, I mean, I think it depends on the institution. It does depend on the composition. But I find that um, kind of the acknowledgement of like, you know, everybody has uh, an experience that is, uh, that is kind of pushing their belief on these issues is helpful to begin the conversation, but not shy away from the fact that there are structural <laughs> barriers that impact populations, uh, you know, disparately and, and differently. So, um, so I think it's just coming from a, a place of, of honesty and, uh, and being true to, to kind of who I am is the best way that I've been able to do it. And at some point I also have to say, well, there might be three or four students that don't like this conversation and I'm gonna to have to move with that. I would just, um, I agree with everything that Lou said. I would, I would add, I start out in my first um, class making students aware that race is a constant part of this conversation um, and that we're going to talk about it, that it's important, to, why it's important to talk about it um, and how we're going to talk about it. Um, I also make clear to them um, that everyone has something to learn. Um, if the conversation is about uh, gender, everyone has something to learn. If the conversation is about race, that I'm still learning um, about, uh, about race and how to uh, think about these issues and how to engage on racial justice issues. So that there's no one in our class who's beyond, um, who knows enough that they don't want, they don't need to keep on um, keep on learning. If students are uncomfortable, I never force anyone to participate in the conversation. Uh, they can sit back and listen, and I will take the lead on uh, moving the conversation forward. Or if students are engaging, then I will sit back and allow them to uh, take more of a, a, a lead in engaging. And there's something in the question that I wanted to um, respond to. It said that in your lessons on racial justice, and I would just encourage you to not have there be a lesson on racial justice, that it just be a part of every conversation, every class where it is relevant and it is always, almost always relevant, that it's raised and it becomes a more um, natural piece of the conversation uh, to have. And uh, our last question, I don't know that we have too much time for it, but any advice about getting organizational clients that need uh, law student services, but who also can appreciate the pedagogical aspect of the work that we do. Um, and I'll take a stab, quick stab at that and then see if anybody else has anything to add. But um, I think this, the kind of the endeavor of the Network for Justice generally is to begin to identify those clinics, right? And those organizations who have need for each other and figure out how to help and connect. Um, I think also there's organizations like uh, Law for Black Lives that has been doing that for a few years. Um, and um, so I think there's definitely um, organizations or people you can connect with to, to help do that. But it definitely takes, I think, conversation with uh, nonprofit organizations to make sure that they understand that, you know, ultimately what we're here to do as instructors is to provide an education to our students and that there is a pedagogical uh, element to any service work that we do. Does anybody else want to add? Okay, right. I will. I will just add that I tend to use my uh, my personal networks as well. Um, from I, I know organizations that are both in need, um, but also 
understand the importance of um, respecting the pedagogical goals uh, of a clinic um, and that they can spend the time allowing students, right? Uh, if they want me to, they have to know that partnering with my clinic does not mean that I'm going to do the work, that I don't replace the students in any way, shape or form. And if um, it might take me a week to write that brief with you, but it's gonna take my students uh, two or three weeks and that has to be okay um, with partners. And I, I, I try to be explicit about that. I would also just say that we, um, we do two things at the outset. We, we try whenever we can to develop MOUs with the organizational partners. And, uh, and we try to have, when possible, have the students uh, draft those with the partner and uh, in consultation with the, the um, instructor, you know, so that everybody's like really on the same page and very intentional about the language. And, um, and even if the students aren't involved in that drafting process, uh, we, we try to have the students kind of at the outset in establish in some of those establishing a relationship type of uh, conversations. So it's very clear that from the, from the beginning, whenever possible, um, that kind of tripartite organizational student instructor kind of uh, piece is, is, is very present. Well, thank you all so much for, uh, for joining us. And I wanna thank the panelists, uh, Deborah, Carrie, Denise, and Louise for, uh, for guiding this conversation. And we hope that you will join us again in two weeks for our last series of our webinar on April 22nd. We were gonna, we're gonna be talking about farm worker employment justice. And um, the other thing I'll add is that the video of this webinar and all our previous webinars will be available at, Tam at uh, tamulawanswers.info. So thank you again for joining us and we look forward to continuing this conversation.